Welcome to the Sleepy G Show. I'm your host for your most. My name is Gomez. And today, wow, I, I, another special great guest here. It's nothing but uh, nothing but MLB we're talking here because why I have another MLB player that is coaching now who's done a lot of stuff and I cannot wait to inter- introduce him to the show. Let's introduce Bruce Maxwell. What's going on, Bruce? Hey, what's going on, my man? How are you, dude? I am doing good, man. I'm doing good. You know, it's uh, it's August. Pennant race is coming around the corner. Uh, you know, I, I I just saw you the other day. You're at the the Oakland game. Yeah, uh, cheering out your old team there, uh, which is always good to see. You know, that's always a bright spot. You know what I mean? As you're there, and uh, you know, good seats by the way. I saw you had good seats. Oh <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they 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 still uh they still take care of me up there. I mean, they they've always treated me with respect even out of uniform, man. So always grateful to 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 deal with the with the Coliseum and the A's themselves and I always try to say hello about once a year or so. And that's awesome. So the, let's we're going to kick start with you started playing baseball back in the day. Now, before we start getting into it, I, I got to ask your parents or your dad was in the military, right? Mm-hmm. And yeah. you were actually born in Germany. Now, tell me the lifestyle a little bit about being a, I hate to say the word, I know everyone uses it, but I'm not going to say army brat, but like an army child growing up. I, uh, I mean, I, I was fortunate, I guess I was on like the back end of my dad's career. Oh, okay. Um, You know, I, w- I think we were in Germany for like two, three years, maybe before he got stationed back in Alabama. And then, then my dad got out shortly after that. And then he started working for the military. So where I was raised in Alabama, I mean, I spent majority of my life there. So I wasn't, I didn't get to really, um, I'm not going to say experience, but I didn't get to experience that that moving every other year type uh, military career that my dad possessed. It was pretty it was pretty chill. So it, it was I was very fortunate in that part. Oh, that's a good thing that because, you know, I always hear I, I and I known one for a long time where she moved and she was unfortunately a military girl and her dad moved from like California to China to Germany uh, to Spain, back to New Jersey. And yeah, they, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't have to. Thank God, I didn't have to experience any of that as a child. So that's a good thing. Now, we're definitely gonna get into your baseball career a little bit. Tell me how you got into playing baseball. Uh, I just, I just developed a love for for with, for my dad. You know, with my dad, my dad loved the game. My dad was a good athlete uh, growing up. You know, my dad never played college or any of that, but. Mm-hmm. Um, he just loved sports and his love was for baseball. And so growing up at, you know, attached to his hip, you know, I, I kind of developed my own love and my own way for the game. Um, and it just kind of turned into, you know, a passion of mine. Um, I, I tell, I tell people all the time, you know, I don't, I don't, I never really played baseball because I just love the game itself. Mm-hmm. Um, I played it because I, I like conquering task i like the complexity of it i love thanks dude um i love the complexity of it i love the uh the difficulty of it you know it's a i'm a complex thinker i I like the challenges because every day the beautiful part about it is you never figure it out right you know and i so i fell in love with the work i fell in love with the struggle i fell in love with the with the with the day-to-day training and development especially mentally Mm-hmm. You know, this game is mental, man. It's 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 hard to get up every single day and go train after school, after, you know, you train another sport, um, all those little bitty things. Like, it's very, very difficult to do, especially as a child. And I was fortunate enough to have a dad there to push me to, to kind of, I wouldn't say force me, but, you know, reiterate, like, hey, if this is what you want, this is what's going to take every single day. You and, know, so I, I formulated it into my own love for the game. And don't get me wrong. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I love baseball. I just like kind of I think I love it in a different way than most people do. No, and I understand that because I developed, you know, my father was a huge supporter of me playing sports. And when I first started playing soccer, I was a goalkeeper. So my dad being Hispanic loved the fact that I was a goalkeeper. You know what I mean? Yeah. And um, as I got to high school, Um, My high school didn't have a soccer team. So I learned how to play football. Now I always played football 
well, in, in grammar school with friends, you know, tackle football, you know, because I was the big guy. I always had the ball. So no one could take me down. No, back yeah, in those no, days, exactly. you know, grab the ball and you just run with it. And I remember the uh, the high school coach saw me and he's like, dude, you're going to play high school football here. I'm like, ah, no. So I went, I, I, you know, the funny thing is my dad was a good, he was a good pusher for me. But yeah. it was my coach who set a mindset for me that I never thought I'd do. And he challenged me in a different way than my parents couldn't. And nothing wrong with that. You know what I mean? There's, you always need someone to give you everybody that. needs everybody needs somebody. I mean, a I swift kick I, in the butt. Yeah. I, I train kids now and I've worked with kids for a long time. And I, I tell people all the time, I was like, the way I coach and the way I train, like I push kids and I push them in a way that sometimes their parents really can't reach that level because I'm not their parent. Mm -hmm. And I totally understand, especially when I work with my teenagers, like my young teenagers and stuff. I tell them, I was like, dude, like I'm going to push you in a much different way than your parents. will." And, it, but it, but it, everybody needs that person. I was fortunate that my coach and my dad was that person. My, I got, oh. I, I got to give both parents my credit because they pushed me when the coach talked to them and they said, we're going to push him to where he's going to die of exhaustion mm -hmm. and you'll thank me later. And to this day, the mentality I still have, I, I'm trying to endorse it into my kids, even though they're young, you know, they're seven and four, but the dedications I'm trying to teach my daughter as she's now a dancer. Yeah. This is her second year on the, on the dance team. I'm teaching her now it's dedication. The hard work is starting to come in. Yep. You're in second grade, sweetie. I love you to death, but now you're going to be pushed. It, exactly. And then there's no, there's a, I mean, I feel like there's different ways to do yeah. it, man. And then, and like my parents made it clear to us that they, they were not our friends when we were kids, you know, and, and I respect the hell out of my parents now because of it, because right. without those type of teachings, I wouldn't have gotten to pro ball. I wouldn't have done what I did in college. I wouldn't have been able to play in other countries. I wouldn't have the success that I've had on the field um, without those type of teachings. And without the type of. Uh... And, and the funny thing is one thing, Bruce, is that you had probably the, you know, the picture is one of the biggest things on the team, but to be honest with you, I always thought the catcher, is the second most important person on that team because you control the flow, you know? Yeah. I and mean, what the, the, I mean, what a lot of people don't know is I, I never caught until pro bowl. I, I, I was just about to say that. Yeah. Like you I was a, I was an infielder in college, man. First like, baseman, never, right? Yeah. I never really um, dabbled at third, but I, I played majority of the time first base. Uh, but I've been an infielder my whole life, dude. Like I, I just, when the A's drafted me, um, I think they drafted – I think they changed me because the pick before me was our franchise first baseman. Okay. Like um, Matt Olson. Oh, Matt Olson. Yeah, so okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure that they, that's that was a reason. And, like, me being a little shorter, a little stockier, like, I kind of fit the mold of a catcher, mm -hmm. you know. And, uh, and then my athleticism as a whole, like, I think they thought that was going to be beneficial, which – I'm glad it happened because, you know, 13 years of pro baseball in four different countries, like, like I can't really complain too much. And so I, I had to, dude, I had to learn that at 21 years old, man. I was about I, to say, how it, was that transition? You're going from first it was base. terrible. I mean, I remember I played first base and second and uh, right field when I was growing up playing baseball. Yeah. And I remember going to, they're like, hey, we need a catcher. I said, I'll do it. Now, I was a little bit of a wise ass. I'm not going to lie as a catcher. Uh, you know, uh, I will say I, I used to talk a little smack behind the plate uh, yeah. against hitters. You know, I, again, I don't know what MLB players do, but I know as a kid, I did. Uh, we don't, we don't, <laughs> there's, there's none of that going on, man. There's a, uh, I tell people when you see catcher and hitter, like if you see them talking, it's more of like a, Respect. like, Hey, what's going on? Good luck today. Kind of thing. Like I always tell my guys their first at bat turn around. Like I'm like, Hey, good luck today. Be safe out there. Like, and then we get to work, you know, right. unless it's like one of your homies, like I got friends of mine that I play with. We like have 
full blown conversations in between innings and stuff. Yeah, no, I get you. Because you might not be able to get to see them a lot, you know. So, like, we have conversations that have nothing to do with baseball. Um, How's the family? We'll have, yeah, yeah. And like, if I get on base and I'm friends with the first baseman, we'll be over here talking about his kids or like whatever. It's not really about the game because we know how to play it, you know. No, I'm not I a big uh, I'm not a big shit talker to be completely <laughs> honest with you because I'm usually so focused on what I'm doing. Right. Like, I'm, hey, what's going on? Or like my my friends know I might I might take a jab at them, but it's not like in an overall. It's like me just making fun of them. Like it's, oh it's, yeah it's, yeah. And it's so like, it's it's one of those things. It's not like these kids in high school and stuff that legitimately taunt each other. Like yeah. when you get to the professional level, it's it's more about mutual respect like mm -hmm. if you're going to be disrespectful okay i'm going to be disrespectful but other than that there's not a whole lot of jawing unless you got like personal issues with people with somebody yeah like there's yeah. always i mean like i said i you know i would talk smack uh with some of my good friends like when especially when we were playing against other towns like uh here in jersey we play like hasbro kites i kind of knew the center i'm like hey how's your sister doing yeah uh, is she ready yeah. to date it's, me <laughs> it's 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 like friendly banter like, yeah it is <laughs> It's not like it's not like you you walk up to the plate and I'm like, hey, fuck you. You, you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's not it's not a, it's not a thing, though, because no. like, when you get higher and I get I feel like in sports in general, um, especially like baseball, baseball is so damn hard, man. It is. And it's so hard to get there. It's like there there's some level of like mutual respect mm -hmm. that kind of kind of lines up with your competitiveness. Right, because at the end of the day, it's like we all know and we have respect for each other, but it's like we all know that like you could be Aaron Judge, Mike Trout, whatever, and you can still have a bad day today. You could like, be Giambi or well, or housing and, back in the day too. And today, days. and today and tomorrow could be completely different. Yeah, like your first half of the game could be way different than the second half of the game. Like no matter how well you prepare, no matter how successful you are you're not going to look great all the time. And no. so I feel like we all understand that. Mm -hmm. And we're all trying to compete. The beautiful part is we all compete against the game of baseball. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, we compete against each other. Right. But how many times have you seen a guy go out there and pitch really bad and still win, but also then on, on the other hand, pitch really good and still lose, right? Yeah. It's – a lot of things you can't control, but it's like the the preparation to compete. I think it's respected by a whole lot of like ball players. So then, unless you got per like I said, unless you got personal issues with people, there's not a whole lot of like I mean legitimate, like negativity going on. Yeah, I mean for me, any any I'm gonna say any professional baseball player, hockey player, football player, anybody who plays pro sports, man, I have to give the credit where credits due, man, because. My that was a dream of mine a long time ago. You know what I mean? Like when I was playing football. Yeah. I, I really wanted to go to Notre Dame and wear the gold helmet. I don't care about running out to the field. I really just wanted my, to wear the my helmet. Dad, my dad's favorite team. Yeah, same here. I'm a I'm a huge Irish guy. I'm not gonna lie. Yeah. Uh, I, I get a lot of flack for being an Irish guy, but I, I am a huge Irish fan. I went to an Irish Catholic school. Okay. So so for me, the, it Makes was sense. Duke, Duke and Irish. That's that was embedded in my head. Duke for basketball, Irish for football. Don't ask Makes me sense. why. Don't ask me why Duke, but everyone was loving Duke at that time. Yeah. Coach K was winning many games in the 90s, and I was like, hey, I love the Dukes because I like the color. Yeah, you know? no, it makes sense. My parents, my family's from Indiana. so oh, okay. Yeah, so. I, then that, I understand that. Yeah, it plays a part. <laughs> so for me as a New Jersey, you know, I should be liking Rutgers. You know what I mean? But unfortunately, yeah. I'm an Irish, diehard Irish fan. Um, I, I'll, you know, my wife goes, I can't believe you love Notre Dame. I go, ah. I said my bucket list before I die is to catch one game at that field. And I had three opportunities, but we had kids. So try it. If you're going to, if you're going to do it, if you're going to do it and it'd be like a one stop, like one time thing. Yep. Got to go to the Michigan game, bro. That's I've heard is that in Ohio state. Those are the two biggest but the Michigan. The Michigan game is second to none, bro. I know. I, I keep hearing that. that. It's like, that's, I'm not gonna lie, Bruce. It's gonna be a dream. So it's a, it's a bucket list right now. It's on the top of the bucket list that everything I want to do. And she goes, I can't believe you just want to go to an Irish game. I go, listen, you took me to the one at MetLife Stadium for Syracuse. I love you. You got me 
third row from the field. I love you for that one. But I go, nothing beats being at Notre Dame Stadium. Walking. Nothing. Nothing, yeah. nothing compares. I've always, I've always wanted to go to the Michigan game because my – so my dad – and one of my aunts on my mom's side, they used to go at it with each other because she graduated from Michigan. Oh, okay. So she's so a big Wolverine. The, the, dude, the banter between them for 30 years, bro. It's, it's still it's still going on to this oh, day. Oh, dude, it, it's it's unmatched. It's oh, unmatched because my, my aunt's a smart ass. So is my dad. And they just go at it, bro. And it's the funniest thing on the planet. But – it's like that game itself, though, is is on. It's next to none. Yeah, I know. It, it's it's like you're. It's like you're out. Like I root for the Tide. Mm -hmm. Like just, I grew up in Alabama. Well, no, like, and that's fine. Alabama's a great team and, every year. Yeah, and so, but it's like it's like the Alabama Auburn game. Like, yeah, doesn't matter how bad Auburn's doing, how good Alabama's doing. That game is unmatched. It's it's one of those the, the it's I call it Clash of the Titans. Yeah, you know what I mean. You you, you you could put. Any team against like Alabama, but you said Ur Auburn, Alabama, Notre Dame, Wolverines doesn't yeah. doesn't matter where you are. But let me tell you, those are wars. Oh yeah. So, but uh, I know we kind of got lost track here, right. a little bit, but no, no, my fault too. But I love having awesome conversations like this. You know what I mean? Because you're always curious about that person. Now, you get you go to the to the draft. Like, how did that proceed going in the draft that year? and getting picked like what was your feeling what were you thinking um well like you know I, I i had tons of scouts at every one of my games in the season um i was honestly truly just focused on getting my guys to the world series that year mm -hmm. um i had a blast it was it was super fun i put up some you know my best numbers in college and um i went to a couple pre-draft workouts and uh, got some good responses from those and so I, I went into draft day number one. I was speculated and told that I was going to go anywhere between like the fourth and the eighth round. Okay. So day one, I was chilling. Like I was just kind of like, I wasn't even watching. I think I was probably playing video games and stuff. Like I was like, well, I had no expectation. Right. So I was like, okay. And then, um, you know, I got a phone call and said, Hey, we're, we're contemplating the A's called me like, Hey, we're contemplating taking you in supplemental round, like the comp pick. And I was like, okay, what, like whatever. Like, All right. Find me. They didn't end up doing it obviously. And so the next day I woke up probably 15 minutes before the draft started. Cause like I said, I was under the impression like fourth to eighth round ish. Mm -hmm. And so I wasn't, I wasn't paying attention to the second, third round. Like I didn't really care. Right. And um, so I woke up like 15 minutes beforehand. My phone's blowing up. And I'm like, hello. And um, the A's guy was like, hey, listen, um, second round of this pick. This is the money. Um, it's either you, we're giving you the choice whether you go to the top of this round or the, the bottom of this round, but it's still the same money. OK. And I was like, you mean like the round that's about to start? And he was like, yeah, I was like the second one. He was like, yeah. Round two. Like, Absolutely. I'll take the, the second pick. Like, it's fine. Got off the phone with them. The Astros had called me after that, which they had the first pick. And they were have they were like, hey, what's your bottom number here? And oh, I wow. just gave them, I gave them a like a like a 50, 50 K uh estimate above what the A's were offering me, just mm -hmm. because, you know, might as well here, like whatever. Yeah. And I told people, you know. When they called to talk to me about money, yeah, that was the first year of the slaughter pricing. Mm -hmm. And so I did all my negotiations myself. I just told them, I know I went division three, but I'm capable. I want an opportunity, a fair opportunity. Like you're not going to come get me for a hundred grand and get me in the second round type situation. Right. And uh, the Astros called me back. They were like, Hey, that number just doesn't work for us. I was like, all right, cool. I respect it. Like, no worries. And then they call my name. And everybody freaks out and they're like a catcher. And everybody's like, whoa, you're catching now? I was like, yeah, that's what they told me. So got to learn how to catch. So that that first like couple years, man, it was like, I thought it was damn near impossible. Because right. not only am I working on doing something I've never done, um, never done or anything, but. Uh, Thanks. They didn't put your bourbon bag out.
I apologize. No, you're good. He said he gave me freedom. Um, my fault. <laughs> it's uh, all right. It's all right. No, I, I, I'm at I'm at my facility. Where yeah, I know. I kind of figured that. I, yeah, I so, kind of figured that. Um, but uh, going into like you know going into that that first two years of learning everything, like I actually called a pretty good game, but it was like the positioning, the the throwing, the yeah. uh, the anticipation and the uh, the repetitive uh, behavior of like being able to block properly. Um, all those physical things were super, super, super tough. Um, but you know, I, I maintained myself hitting wise, but it was like, it took me a couple of years for me to get confident mm -hmm. in my abilities behind the plate. I knew I was a good ball player, but you know, I went from, you know, blocking for 30% my first year to 50, 60% to 70, 80. And then my, you know, my year I got to the league, um, it was about, it was damn near a hundred. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I figured out, I put it all together with, with the ability to throw quickly and accurately with my strong, with the strong arm that I had, um, being able to call good games, being able to run a cook pitching staff, uh, being able to block and move around and, and, and be a catcher, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, you know, it translated, you know, it translated. I, I got up to the big leagues, um, in 2016, I had great defensive numbers. Um, you know, I, I hit really well my first year. The second year was kind of average. You know, mm -hmm. I was kind of going up and down a lot that year. Um, and then, you know, obviously the last year we could get into it, but it just didn't work out like it, it was kind of supposed to. And so, you know, I, I left there, go to, you know, overseas, go to Mexico or, or out of country, you know, go out there, ball out, win a couple championships or a couple different teams and become kind of a household name down there. Right. So catching it ended up working out. But at <laughs> first, I, I can't tell you how many times I just was like, you know what, I'll give the sign-in bonus back. I quit. Like, like just because it was so demanding and so physically, physically demanding that my mental was just overloaded constantly. Right. And it, I thought I would never get to the big leagues, honestly. Like, I was like, dude, can you just, like, put me back at first? Like I, I'm just, I, I can't do this. Yeah, I'll fight for the first, first, first play, uh, first base. I know. Yeah, but, I mean, but you overcame it and you became an MLB catcher for the Oakland yeah. A's. Like, yeah. What was that phone call like the day that you get the call for the show? How was that like? Oh, it was stressful, dude. I, we had a we had a terrible travel day Ooh. in Nashville. Oh god. We, we we had a, all these complications. Like we got stuck in the airport overnight. Oh. Like we came, we came back to Nashville. I think we were coming back from Albuquerque, but we got, we got uh, stuck in Phoenix because that was at around the time where Delta had like a, like a three day blackout or something. Yeah. I remember that. I, I think so I remember got, that was all 40 of us got stuck in the freaking airport. Oh. Um, we had a, the A's had to charter a flight back to Nashville and seeing how we're going back East. We lost like two hours or so. We ended up pulling up. We got to the airport at seven. Our game was supposed to start at seven. The other <laughs> team was there already. Right. We had to, we literally got in our cars. They said, hey, we'll grab all the equipment, go to the field, warm up, get ready to play. So we we pulled up to the stadium. We got half of our guys don't have anything to practice in because we just came off of a week long road trip. Right. Um, we got guys out here playing catch and other people's clothes. We got fans already in the stands. Everyone's like, waiting. Like, what the hell's going on? So yeah, we're scrambling. So and I I didn't catch the 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 last day of the trip, and I told the manager I was like, hey, I'm good to I'm good to catch like the day we get back. Like through all this crap, I'll catch. I got you. Yeah. And come to find out, I'm not catching. So I was already, I was pissed. And I was like, wait, a minute. I would have been. I haven't caught in three days or two days or whatever. I said, like, what are we doing? Blah, 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 blah. He goes, you can't catch tonight. I was like, what the hell do you mean you can't? I can't catch tonight. I'm physically capable to catch tonight. He goes, you can't catch tonight because you're catching in Oakland tomorrow. Oh, shit. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, and my initial response was like, I don't really give a shit. And I was like, wait a minute. What? He was like, you can't catch tonight because you got to catch tomorrow in Oakland. So you had to fly, you had to go get your stuff, get out oh, of yeah. Na Nashville. Like and my, then now, dude, now my, you're going mom, to Oakland. My mom, yeah, my mom's sister, uncle, 
Uh, all of them were already at the game because they were scheduled to come to that game to watch me catch. Right. Um, I had to walk outside. I was like, hey, I'm not catching tonight. Da -da -da. My mom's like, well, why the hell not? And I was like, because I got to catch in Oakland tomorrow. So, 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 and everybody freaked out. Yeah. I was just about to ask, how was out. the, uh, since you came out and told them like that, yeah. like, uh, I'm Every, not catching. Sorry, guys, but. Yeah. It was like everybody freaked out. And I, after a few minutes of talking to them, you know, I got my flight information. I went back to my apartment, packed up all my stuff, you know, packed up my stuff. Mm. My flight was in the morning. And crazy part about it was, um, hope it wasn't Delta uh, again. Well, I, I know, right? Um, but the crazy part was I flew from Nashville to LA, LAX, yeah. and LAX to San Fran. Okay. Ooh. When I got to LAX, I went over to my terminal. And when I walked to my gate, my dad was there. Like we ended up, we ended up sitting on the same flight from oh, from LA to San Francisco. That's it, so awesome. It, it was and didn't had no idea. Like we didn't know we were on each other's flight. And oh, so, so. I mean, so it it was cool, man. Like getting there, walking in the locker room, and one of my biggest uh, biggest mentors and friends is Coco Crisp. Okay, and yeah. I made, I made him a I made him a deal um, in two thousand fourteen. I think I told him before you retire, I'm gonna play with you in the big leagues. He was like, all right. Well, when he was like, then quit fucking around and get to it. Yeah. You know, like <laughs> I was like, I'm working on, it. I'm working on it. <laughs> And so to be able to walk in the locker room and he's the first person I see and I gave him a big old hug and um, got to play with him for about a month before he got sent over to Cleveland. Yeah, he got traded. And, I remember. Um, so that, that's hard, first, too. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's, it sucked, dude. I was upset. And uh, and so being able to to be in that space and and to to play with those guys that I'm in spring training with, you know, every year that I, I'm learning these things from. And just being able to walk out of that tunnel in this Coliseum, man, and yeah. people are, you know, surrounding that little tunnel asking for autographs and uh, being able to walk out on that field was was truly, truly special for me, especially for an organization as influential and as history filled as the mm -hmm. Oakland A's, you know, Um and then, you know, the next day, that night, I got a pinch hit at bat because the game was out of reach. Right. Struck out. I was swinging about 140 miles an hour. Because you're trying to hit, you're trying to. I, I couldn't see anything, dude. <laughs> I was just like, whack, whack. Yeah. I couldn't hit anything. And uh, the next day, I got the start. And I actually, I actually just came back from the Bay. And I told uh, my coaches, the funny part about me being at the game yesterday was the last time I came here for a game, um, or or the the last time I came here for a game or whatever I was on the field, mm -hmm. you know, was my first debut, my first start in the big leagues. I faced Blake Snell when he was with Tampa. Oh wow! And so yesterday he was starting for the Giants, and I yeah. was at I was at the game. Said so, so it's kind of as like it's kind of cool, right? Because even though he's in a different uniform, last time you know the first time I was on this field as a starter as a starting catcher. He and now I'm. I was going to visit. Yeah. And that was my. That was probably potentially my last game to see it at the Coliseum. He's starting for the Giants. I was like, it's kind of. It's kinda it's kind of funny. It's kind of Roman. Now let me ask you this: that night, the next night, you you get the call to start as the catcher. Do you remember who was your pitcher that night? I always got to ask uh, that question. I know it's it a tough was, one. It was no Jarrell wasn't up yet. Actually, I couldn't tell you. I no, honestly couldn't. It's fair because I, it's a. It's I remember a, who I, I remember who I faced, and I remember who, with, that we won. Okay. So you know, my That's first the, big league game behind the plate, we won. I went zero for four. Don't get me wrong. But, <laughs> That's all right. But it was like we won the game, so that was that was pretty awesome. I actually don't remember who my starting pitcher was. All right. Well, it was it was a dumb question to ask, but you never know. Some people remember that stuff sometimes. I, I remember certain things. All right. But like I, I'm so used to like scouting reports of other people. No, I get you. I tend team. to remember my opponent more than my own like my own your team. own pitcher. Yeah, your own team. Well, yeah. As a catcher of a team, you are one of the most important people. Besides, like I said, everyone the team's important, but you are one of the commander of chiefs, as I say, as a catcher and the pitcher, because you guys are reading the reports on everybody's every player. I mean, everyone does, but 
when you're the pitcher and the catcher, you guys have to communicate very well. Correct. I mean, hey, you're looking at the the coach for the signs, like, hey, what am I going to throw here? Like, three zero, do we? Does he take the first strike? You know what I mean? Three zero yeah. count. Well, does- that that's the that's the crazy part. Like when I got to the big leagues, man, the people don't see what happens behind the scenes. Like we don't we don't get pitches from our dugout. Like oh, okay. once you once you enter pro ball, dude, you call your own games. Okay. Like, I mean, that's why I don't know. Like, that's why well, it's it's good to know. Yeah, but it was like it was like I tell guys all the time, like you know when I'm when we have the first game of the series, like we get to the ballpark. Most of the time, your catchers are pretty early, mm-hmm. but we'll have we can go in the video room and do our own work, and then we have a meeting with our catching coach, and we go back into the video room to evaluate things. Mm-hmm. We go over the scouting report, and then we have a pitchers meeting before batting practice. Then we'll have a hitters meeting before ba- or after batting practice. And then the starting catcher, starting pitcher, pitching coach, and catching coach all have a meeting after that before we go out on the field to stretch to get ready for the game. Just it's so like, you guys I are have, like. Yeah, we have we, catchers have at least two meetings a day just for that day. Right. And it, and it goes over, it goes over, you know, two strike tendencies for this batter he's been hot on the, in this location lately against this type of pitcher. Um, when the game time comes down to it, who are we avoiding? Who are we, who are we pitching to um, strengths and weaknesses of, of our guy today, strength and weaknesses of your bullpen against their whatever lineup that they right. might. I mean, dude, it goes on and on and on. Like we get, I, I'll never forget this. When we, my first road trip, I think we went to Texas. I, th- I think so. Ooh. I think it was in Texas. We were going to Texas. We get on the plane. We're about to take off. Our video guy comes up to all the catchers. There's like three of us at the time. And he hands us a no, uh, a binder about this big. Holy and I shit. was like, yo, what is this? And I looked at it. It's a Texas Rangers 2016. And literally, you flip through it, man. And it's every single hitter, hot, cold, what they've done in the last five games, what they've done in the last 10, how's their last month been, mm-hmm. this is what they've been feasting on, da 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 all those things have to be in our brain to formulate the most accurate and efficient game plan for tomorrow. Now it doesn't mean it always works, but like we control that, like the pitcher has say, don't get me wrong. Oh yeah. No, I know you can shake it off and stuff like that. That that in that engine has to be in our head the whole time. And that's, that's one of the, and then obviously, you know, four times a game, we got to go hit. Yeah. And so that's one of the reasons why a lot of times your catchers don't very hit, hit hit very well because we have to focus and dedicate so much time to our defense. Yeah. That by the time we get to hit, bro, it's very hard to shut your brain off. Well, yeah, especially when you're trying to figure out with defensive strategies, like when you have to do the uh, the shift. Yeah. For a certain no, player. All of, yeah, all of that. We have to we have to manage like we have to pay attention to it. We have to we have to adjust to it. We don't control it, but we also have to make adjustments within the game plan to make sure the shift is in play to get this guy out best. And yeah. like all those adjustments and, and strategies come from us. And that's why they always say that, you know, your former catchers tend to make the best managers because even in uniform, like our job is to manage the game. And it's and it's probably one of the most hardest. That's why I say catcher. Mm-hmm. like you 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 pointed out earlier in the sh- in the in the interview how important the dedication the time the strategy you know you don't realize like you went into more depth as an MLB catcher than I, I ever knew because I I knew it was tough I knew it was rough but I didn't know you had four meetings before a game right before you stretch when you get there early at the ballpark you know what I mean you just I never knew that, oh yeah, you, you people like me don't realize that, and that's something I commend you for because let me tell you, it, it takes time, and so and time you don't have. I grant you, you got a three three game series or a four game series, say against the Rangers, or when you think of at that time the Yankees were winning, the Texas Rangers, you guys. Oh yeah, there was a bunch of amazing teams, but I do have to ask, what was your favorite place to play when you were, when you were playing with the A's besides the Coliseum? Coliseum I, is always, always home. I, I'd, I'd probably say the best stadium that we played in was the Mets place. Shea, uh, uh, City I, Field. 
I I loved it, man, because it was just so vibrant inside that stadium, especially mm -hmm. at nighttime. Like everything's lit up, dude. Like, don't get me wrong. Like everybody will tell you, no matter who they play for, like certain teams have terrible fans. Oh, but God. it's like, but it's like when we went there, dude, it was like New York City in the stadium. Oh, yeah. Like, everything's lit up. The crowd was electric, even though they were playing us that year. Um, it was awesome. It, I mean, it was you felt like you were in a big league environment. You know, mm -hmm. it was it was it was incredible. And the Phillies place, you know, I, I got the opportunity to catch Daniel Mingden. We oh, were wow. both rookies in 16. We threw a complete game shutout. And that's all. Philly. And Philly was like the hottest hitting team in, in baseball at the yeah. time. Yeah, I we actually, went to Philly. Yeah, we went to Philly, bro. It was electric. I'll like, tell you. Electric. I am I, I love see I for me from New Jersey, I am a Yankees fan, naturally. But oh. okay. but ever for me, Jeter was the 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 team. You know what I mean? Like, listen, Bernie Williams, Jeter, Tino Martinez, Jason Giambi, Ted Mark Sichera, Jorge Posada. Yeah. was another guy I, I always followed and I always admired, you know what I mean? And I always say, like, I am a fan of the game, but when Jeter retired for me, I just became more of a fan of the sport. Correct. You know? um, that's what that's what happens. I mean, yeah. Griffey was my favorite player growing up, still is to this day. So kind of when he left, I was like, eh. Yeah. Right. I mean, <laughs> I'll be honest with you, I, like, I have a collection of hats. Like, right now, today – I was like, well, I don't know what hat to pick, so I chose the socks. I wanted okay. the white socks hat, but okay. I'll show you. I have a, a small little collection growing. I'll even show it to you here. I just gotta unblur this, and everyone's like, "You have a collection." I go, "Yes, I do." So if you turn around here, okay, you know, some of my, you. you know, some of my favorite ones. I mean, because a, I love some of the team hats. Like I have. The, you're, you'll laugh. I have the 97 World Series uh, Florida Marlins hat, the original Florida Marlins hat. Not, okay. not not the Miami Marlins. Yeah, not the Miami Marlins. Yeah, the Florida and Marlins. Yeah. The, the Florida Marlins with the fish and the F. I love that hat. Granted, they beat the Yankees that year, but <laughs> it's one of those things to respect. Like everyone goes, You have a Philly hat. Why do you have a Philly hat? You're a New Yorker. Because I love the 1980 maroon white one. That's why. Why do I have a Toronto Blue Jays hat? Why? Because I love the color. I like the Blue Jay. I'm not a Canadian, but I love the hat. Now you're you're a fan of the game. Yes. Like, like it's the same thing with me. I have I have a lot of hats from different countries. Right, and that's the thing because like, because I love like I I walk around here all the time with my Dominican hat on. Right. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, I speak Spanish and everything, but that's a good thing. I love it because their hats, like Venezuela, like Cuba, all the, their hats, bro, are awesome. Hey, I'm Cuban. I, I get so them because I know. of the color combination. So, so do I. I. I you know, that's why I tell people. I was like, I, I, if I get six hats that are different colors, it matches all my clothes. So we're I'll good. be honest, with you, if I get a hat from anybody, I'm I'm ecstatic. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I mean, I love for some reason I love the San Diego Padres hat. No, I, I like Padres hat. I like the brown and the yellow. Don't ask me yeah. why. It's just a great color combination. Correct. LA Dodgers, just a uh, just an old school like the Yankees hat. Tradi it's a traditional, traditional. Yeah. Same thing with the Cubbies hat. It's the same way. Socks. I always love the socks hat because it's just socks right there in the middle. Traditional. Correct. Yeah. And, and no, that's, it's, it's it's different. Like everything is different. Like it has different meanings to people. I, mean, I even have the Pittsburgh hat and I'm not even a Pittsburgh guy. I love Pittsburgh's hat. I, I love, I mean, I have the black one right up there with the P yellow and I love it because of the color. I love Detroit's. And the next hat, I, I was kind of funny when uh, I saw it, I was like, damn it. I need an Oakland's hat. I didn't get it in time. Yeah, I love the colors because it's something different, the green and the yellow. Yeah. And, you know, to put that uniform on for as long as you did, too, it's got to be such a feeling that you, you – nothing – that cannot be taken away from you. Mm -mm. No, nah, and it's just like I, I – you know, this weekend I, I did some things up in Oakland with the Ballers and the A's and mm -hmm. community-wise, and I, I love the city of Oakland, dude, like – I couldn't be further away from Oakland, like where I'm from. Right. But it's like they adopted me into that organization and the city did. And so being able to play for them, regardless of the the shit that went on, was an absolute pleasure. Like mm -hmm. I I tell all the people I told them this weekend, like people were like, Hey, we miss you here. Like you should still be in the big leagues, blah, blah. And I was like, Yeah. I said, but it doesn't take away what I like I appreciated playing here. 
Right. Like, I love playing. Don't get me wrong. Like you'll talk to anybody and we'll all say the same thing. Like, yeah, they could update this or they could upgrade that or they could clean up this or whatever with the stadium itself. But being able to play for the A's, man, mm -hmm. like it's 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 something that it meant a lot more to me than just like playing ball. Right. It was like you, it was you, get to, you get to you get well, you get to play for a historical city mm -hmm. and community like that, dude. It's it's and, you know, the A's had their Kelly Greens, which I absolutely loved. Uh, the all whites are crispy, dude. Yeah. I, I loved when we wore all whites, right? Um, I love. I, I did love that one too, actually. I'm yeah, not gonna lie. like it's just traditional all whites, like mm -hmm. nothing too crazy, um, you know. But being able to put on that uniform and you walk out of that tunnel and in, in the Coliseum, and regardless of what's going on, being able to walk out of that tunnel as a big leaguer is it's magical, man. Like I can't. when I when I walked into the dugout to grab my stuff an hour before game time to go walk down to the bullpen mm -hmm. to go talk to my people um, while I'm stretching to sign some autographs, like to to be able to do that is it's it was magical for me. I can only imagine, it's never, man. It's never just been like my job, right? Like, and so I've and it was to be back on there this weekend, you know, um, as a player as a fan technically um and to just see all the people in the stands the last two days and being able to see that the, that regardless of the shit mm -hmm. oakland a's fans are second to none i can only imagine i mean that place, any, was, that place was rocking I anytime i mean i i i've seen the I, i've seen the history i know the history of the a's i mean like yankees to you know the stadium from the old one to the new one. Don't get me wrong. I kind of miss the old one more than the new one, but that's my Same. taste. You know what I mean? I'm not going to lie. I mean, I, I grew up on that, on the old stadium. I was thrilled to see the new one, but I'm like, yeah, just the, it's not the house that Ruth built. Reggie Jackson, Derek Jeter. Oh, that was, that was the one thing I was, I think, cause, cause when did they build the new one? What was Two, it? I want to say it's 2016 or 17 or is it 14? I think, I think it was six. Mm, I think it was 16 because we played them in 17. Okay. And it was the new one. Okay, so you were at the new I, one. I was, so that was I was a little bummed out because yeah. I was wanting to play in the old one. I can only yeah. I was so. gonna say that's got it's nostalgic, especially. But I mean, don't get me wrong. But I mean, for me, growing up as a Yankee fan, I I always think of the old stadium, run down. You know, things are falling apart here and there. But that's those are the fun ones for me. Yeah, no, I, I mean, mean, because because those places have history, mm -hmm. like, and if you're if you're a fan of the club or if you come from the area, you know it. So it's like when you walk in, you can feel it. Same thing in Boston. Yeah, like, dude, their clubhouse, their visiting clubhouse is terrible. I can only, I can't but, even imagine. But when you walk out of that dugout, seeing the green you monster, see the big green monster, you see Ted Williams, see Darren Batten, yeah. just you see. You're like, I could, I can do this. Like, I can, I, cause you can feel it, dude. When we were on BP, I was like, I turned around my first day in Boston. I'll never forget this. I was standing out in the right field and I just turned around and I looked at one of my teammates. I said, Do you realize how far that seat is? Yep. Yeah. He was like, What do you mean? I was like, That red seat, that bright red ass seat right there. The only one that you could really identify it. I was like, This man. First of all, I'm standing in right field. The guy hitting right now looks this big. Yep. That seat is back, not up. It's, it's back. back. And I was like, and this was back in the day where they swung tree trunks for bats. Yep. And the baseballs weren't, you know, flight available like they are now. Oh, yeah. Tightly wound like the new leather. I was like, this man hit this baseball 900 feet. Like – like and and I'm I'm just over here like bro I don't even and I'm a lefty I was like I could try my hardest I wouldn't even get close to that damn ball I can't only like, imagine well and it's like so when you get into those types of places like you understand why they're kind of run down a little bit but mm -hmm. the history is in the and the fan base is what holds it together you know what I, I'm saying? oh it yeah I mean I've never been to Fenway so I always watched it on TV because I was a <clears throat> Yankees fan. Um, uh, it's hard for me, you know, I, that the one hat I don't think I could ever wear on my head. hundred percent. Is a Boston Red Sox hat. I, yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to say it. And 
probably get shit for it, but I don't care because it's the one team that, besides the Mets, it's the one team that I just, uh, I don't know what it, well, I love the city of Boston. I love the city. But but it's it's the it's what it means though to be like you're a Yankees fan. Yeah. So it's it's like forbidden. And that's yeah. the type of culture. It's like when you go to the bay, you won't see people, you won't see people rocking those those A's Giants jerseys. No. You won't see people in Oakland rocking Giants hats. Like it, it's not a thing, bro. But it just comes with the culture of your team's mm. rivalry. Like, oh yeah. Like, you think yeah, about there, it. there's no there's no gray area. Like, <laughs> no, 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 no. It's forbidden, dog. It, it is big time forbidden. Like for me, it's just it's nostalgic as just one of those things, like you said. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, for me, one of the stadiums I always wanted to visit is definitely uh Oakland Stadium. I, I always wanted to go to Coliseum to catch a game there. I've never got a chance to because yeah. travel, I'm not a big fan of flying. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I hate to fly. Uh that's one it scares the crap out. I'm flying in the air. It's a landing and a takeoff. I'm scared shitless. I'll say it. But it's just getting out there. I mean, uh, I just had a friend of mine, a coworker, just went, caught a Padres game when he went out to California. Mm-hmm. Went to San Diego, caught a Padres game. I'm like, that had to be awesome, Petco Park. You know what I mean? Like, Yeah, that place is pretty dope. I, ne- uh, I never got the opportunity to play there. But it's just, it looks like a, a good spot. But LA Dodger Stadium, too. Dodger Stadium is another nostalgic stadium. Yeah. I've heard stories. Matter of fact, I had Greg Golson on the show not too long ago. Mm-hmm. And we were, and he was just telling me as a pro scout for the LA Dodgers, what it was many meaning to him to get walk the halls, see mm-hmm. some of the names. And I'm just like the history, dude, like it's I, just history. And that, and I, I respect that a lot. I never got to play that. Se- I didn't play that series with them in 18, mm-hmm. but I, I, I was kind of salty that I didn't I, just, just to say that, you know, I played like, at Dodger for, Stadium. For me, like I played at Dodger Stadium. Type. But, I was in the dugout, but like I never. You really didn't get a chance. Long. Yeah. Yeah. But now we advance a couple years now. Now you're you're, you're coaching. Mm-hmm. And you're now with the Toros of the Tijuana. Yeah, I, I was I was this year, man. I um this year I started in Mexico as a player. Okay. With a different team. Didn't work out. Mm-hmm. Shit happens. And then as I'm coming home. I got a phone call from Tijuana asking me to be their catching coach. Okay. So I was like, all right, this is my first professional coaching job. I was like, right now I don't have anything. I don't have anything on the table at this moment. So why not? You know, like it'll, it'll boost my resume for post playing career type Mm -hmm. stuff. Um, Wayne coached for them again, unfortunate events, you know, didn't work out. A lot Mm -hmm. of us got moved. And uh, and then, you know, now I'm down here in Southern California um, training kids, training kids, training young adults, um, catching, hitting, infield work and just trying to instill my, my knowledge and experience in these kids nowadays, because what these kids need to learn Jeez. is you can't get anything by sitting on your ass. Right. That's like, true. Like we live in a world with that's filled with convenience. Mm hmm. Now and these kids are are getting used to everything kind of just happening because they're supposed to, right? And they're going to be in for a rude awakening as they get older. Like these kids don't know how to properly train. They don't know how to. They don't. They don't know how to work. Like they don't know the proper work ethic. They don't know that in order for you to get somewhere that you want to go, you got to dedicate that time mm-hmm. to it. You have to be obsessed with it. You have to to sacrifice for it. Yeah. You know and and that's how I coach, you know, I, I mm. teach catching predominantly because that's a big need in yeah. the community. Um, and so you can't watch YouTube and just teach people how to catch. It doesn't work that way. No, and so I try to express and share my as much knowledge as I can to my, to my kids and to my young adults, um, because it's something that's needed. And I love to teach. I love to, to, I love to coach, mm-hmm. um, and it's just, it's just it's I think it's needed in the future and in our future generation. And so, you know, I just like I, I, I was mentored in pro ball. Yeah. I'm now doing it. You know, I, I used to work with kids in Mexico. Um, I worked with kids in the Dominican because I speak Spanish. Um, you know, I, I've worked with kids all over the country 
And um, I just try to continue to do that every single day and, and give back to our future ball players because at one point in time I was given to by our our you know our our ball players at at said time. I was admit I was a coach. I became a coach the year after high school, fresh, graduated high school, got her, mm -hmm. missed my opportunity to play college ball. Division three didn't matter where I was going to play. I was yeah. going to play ball, and I hurt my knee, and my window closed. So. I was, you know, working part-time, going to school part-time. Like, hey, could I co help out, you know, in the field? I, I just don't want I, – I still love the game. And I started coaching. And what I told my kids and, you know, the kids that I was coaching, the freshman team, I said, one thing I've learned and one thing I'm going to teach you kids is first thing is not the sports. Family. Your family is the first thing. School is going to take you somewhere. Football mm -hmm. will come third. Mm -hmm. Sports will come third. And one thing that I've learned, you know, one of my mistake was I didn't have a mentor my freshman or my sophomore year. I, I punched around going, ah, I'm going to play college ball one day. I'm not going to need any of this. My yeah. mistake. I made that mistake. And I taught those kids not to do it. And those were good kids. And they ended up being good students, scholarships, not just yeah. football scholarships, academically too. So yeah. my coach, my high school coach had a good team always. And that's one thing I preach now. I, I mean, I miss coaching, uh, you know, with family now and life and now becoming a podcaster. I've been doing this a year and a half by myself. Yeah. And I'm finally making a name for myself. Mm -hmm. um, you know, having you on the show, I had uh, Adrian Chambers the other day, uh, Greg mm -hmm. Olson. I had Drowning Pool on my show. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm getting these names now because I'm finally working, like you said, dedication. Yeah. Well, uh, and it's like when, when I teach, you know, I, I'm, I'm people like to call me old school. Cause like I'm in, I'm in my kids asses about, you know, being alert, playing yeah. hard, being on time, being prepared, focused, focusing while you're training, like mm -hmm. the very, the very tools to life, especially when you're dealing with boys, young men, yeah. And I, I've, I love baseball and I love sports in general, but my dad always taught me that even if I get to the big leagues, you only wear your Jersey for X amount of hours a day. Yeah. And so my dad made sure that the, the very valuable lessons that sports teaches you, I learned at a young age, because when I'm done playing, I mm -hmm. still have to be a person. Yeah. That's so one thing I did learn. You, you you can't get anywhere you're going without the sacrifice and dedication and discipline. Yeah. Um, if you're wanting to do this, if you're if and and one thing that my dad always told me when when that stood out and still stands out to this day, I'm 33 years old, is if you're gonna do something, why not do it to be great at it? Right. But in order for you to be great at it, you have to sacrifice for it, you have to be disciplined to get it done, you have to be focused. You have to do your homework. You have mm -hmm. to forever learn. Yeah. And like I, I yell at my kids on non physical things. Like I don't, I don't, I don't care if you miss you miss a ball. Like really, I'm not gonna yell right. at you for making an error. I'm gonna yell at you for making an error because you weren't paying attention. Right. Because and that's you what weren't I understand. Getting, well, because you weren't ready. You weren't mentally present. That's why we make errors half mm -hmm. the time. As a but you know, a lot of these kids you're know, 14, 15 years old and they don't they don't learn those things. <laughs> no, they think it's and, just and natural. I don't yeah, and I and I don't do anything. You could tell you could ask anybody that knows me really well. I don't do anything for quote unquote fun. I do it to compete. Yeah. That's the that's the end. That's goal. that's, that's like, the thing. You're competing for a job, mm -hmm. you're competing for to play yeah. time. Like when I golf, when I when I when I golf, guess what? I'm competing. When I bowl. I love, You're bowling, competing. I love golfing. Those are my things. I'm competing. Like, you know, and, and, and you could still have fun. Yeah. But it's like, but it's like those little, those little skills and tools, especially for young men, they need to understand that. No, guess what? When you get into life, and I'm finding this out now as a civilian for the for the time being, mm -hmm. um, no matter how hard you work and prepare, it doesn't mean it's gonna happen. Right. This isn't a contractual life. Like this, I'm 13 years. I've been under contract. Right. It's like you do X, Y, Z. Like mm -hmm. you don't have to worry about nothing. Right. Now it's life. Right. So you have to develop those tools 
to be able to sustain yourself and to be able to handle the bad shit that comes your way and then be ready to appreciate it when it actually pays off. Right. And I'm learning some of those things myself as a 33 year old, but these are the very things that I teach my kids. Like if you want to, if you want to be, if you want to be better tomorrow, you have to sacrifice and be disciplined enough to get it done today. Yeah. And then you got to wake up in the morning. You got to make that choice again. The parties can wait. The friend hangouts can wait. Nobody's saying you can't be a kid or a young adult, but at some point in time, what you want to achieve has to take precedent yeah. over your personal enjoyment in order for you to enjoy it later. And that's and something that's I agree with you. my dad. Well, that's one thing my dad hammered with me. Mm-hmm. Like I tell people I was a soldier as a child, right? Yeah. Yeah. It was it was no matter what sport I played when I got home and I did my homework, I had to go hit. I had to go play catch. I had to go take ground balls, like whatever. I was constantly training. That's mm-hmm. where you get better. All these kids nowadays in youth baseball, they play all pay lost money to go play games, but they don't spend the same amount of money on their development. Their yeah, training. I, that's so one thing can, I remember is yeah. just the training, the development. That's the thing. And that's something yeah. I remember. To this day, I still work on it. I still listen. I'm 44, turning 45 this year, and I'm still developing myself. Yeah, I'm no, realizing, exactly. I'm exactly. realizing it, who I am. It never ends, and you will. It never ends. Yeah, but and it's that's like, one thing. You got you to gotta build that foundation, though, especially in these young boys and young men. And uh, you know, it's hard, bro. Like I, I've talked to plenty of parents. They're like, "We just don't want to fight that battle." I was like, "I'll fight it for you." Yeah, like I'm cool with it because somebody has to do it. Because if not, you're setting these kids up for failure. You know, it's funny. One of my friends gave me the best advice when I started this podcasting world. You know what I mean? And I think it goes through just anything in life. It's not a race. It's a marathon. And I think. Ain't nothing nothing we do in this life a sprint. No. So that's why, you know what? I respect what you're doing, man. I love what you're doing now as you're helping these kids and you're developing them. And I respect that so much, Bruce. You don't believe, you know, I mean, I I say it now, but you got to, I say, if you're taking the time out of your time as, you know, hey, I played for Oakland. I played for this. I did this. But if you want to get to this stage, the show, you need to put in the time. And that's something I know you're putting into these kids. And that's something I respect so much at what you're doing. Yeah, no, I appreciate it, man. I, I try to do things the right way because, you know, I, I, I tell, I've told parents this before, I could care less, like about like five years from now, I could care less how baseball's going for your kid. Mm-hmm. Like I want your kid to hit me up and I'm, I'm hearing that his grades are good, that he got into the college he wanted to go into, right. that, that he's becoming a better man. Like, and for me, baseball taught me those things. Right. Like, and that's be a better person to, to be resilient, to, to learn how to sacrifice, mm-hmm. um, to learn how to be a good person. Like you can be, listen, you, people see clips of me catching, man. I am, I look like I'm about to murder someone. You look like you're going to war with your, yeah. with, the, and, with the sunglasses on. Yeah. And, you and know so what I mean? like, that's, that's a, that's a legit catcher pose you got there going. Yeah. And, and, but that's my, that's my, that's my mantra when I walk on that field, like right. I'm going to war right. and my job is to come out on top after however many innings. I don't care what I'm going to have to put my body through, what I have to go through mentally, uh, no matter how shitty I might hit, no matter how good I might hit. My job is to win the war today. Mm-hmm. Like, and and I can control what I do and how I focus in that. And it takes, dude, I've played through, I've played through, you know, a fractured shoulder. I've played, you know, I had Tommy John already. The surgeon, um, yeah. I've, I've played through many and many of like bang ups that nowadays would fold a lot of people and like I, I played a whole season with a mess like my Tommy John was flared up bad mm. like, ball a couple years ago and I hit like 180 for the season but I'll be I was behind the plate every day because yeah. I was controlling the game very well I was still throwing people out I was blocking everything still. and I gave, I gave my team the confidence right that when if Bruce at 50 percent is 100 percent anywhere else like, yeah like, and and that's the thing, man. Like, I would die on that field if that meant giving my chance, my team, the chance to win that day. Like mm-hmm. I would, I, and I wouldn't even. It was no second thought. Like I, I go out there and I bust my ass for my guys 
no matter how I'm feeling, because it doesn't matter. It's the, it's achieve it's, it's conquering the objective. Yeah. And, and now, you know, it's, it's, I think about it now because I have time <laughs> off. Yeah. You get the time. I'm like, I'm like, dude, some people think probably think I'm a psychopath. Like, and, and, and that's the thing, like, and I, I've told people this for years because they'll see clips of me. They're like, bro, you look angry as fuck. You're just in and the moment. Like, You're well, in I was the like, game. well, I was like, I'm not even angry. Like, I'm, I have 105 things going on in my brain from an hour before that game to when we're done. Yeah. And if I miss on, if I'm off on one of those things, it might screw up everything. Else. And so, but when you see me like that and I'm sitting in the dugout and I'm sitting in the stand and <clears> my, my the bench and I'm just like, just sitting here quiet. I'm just sitting here. You can walk up to me and like, Bruce, I'm like, what's up? What's going on? And I'll turn it off. Yeah. Because, because I'm not <clears throat> like, you need me? You want to talk? Hey, let's talk. Chit chat. Blah, blah, blah. Good. Okay. Sick. Bang. You walk away. I get right back into my zone. That's how like, I was during a game. Like as yeah, a lineman. Until, yeah. You know, I, as a lineman, you know, I'm listening to my general, which is the quarterback. 100%. And I'm listening because you got to understand, and you know, as a tackle or as a guard or as the left tackle, checking the blind side, you got to remember your plays, your, your assignments and everything. And that's one thing I, I took pride in. And 100%, dude, that, that's me behind the plate. Yeah. It's like, I take pride in my catching ability. I take pride in blocking 30 balls every game. Or whenever I have mm -hmm. to, I take pride in my pitcher being confident, even though he's struggling and believing in me, you know, yeah. like I take pride in that shit. Like I could, I could honestly care less if I go four for four, or oh for four. Yeah. There's a part of your personal personality that you want to do great. Right. Yeah. But just because I go oh for four doesn't mean I can't help my team win. And that's and one thing about so, me too. Yeah. And, and I've like... always, I've always been a defensive minded catcher. I've hit well. Yeah. But I've never really focused on my hitting. I'm always focused on my defensive job. I said to my quarterback, you'll never get sacked. I promise you that. If I And if I do, I failed. Like, if yeah. I miss a block, I failed. And that's it's, something and, I took hard. And the yeah, coaches knew how, that. Like, yeah, that's how, I, that's how I go about it, dude. If I can't get you out of a rut on the mound, I feel like it's my fault. Like, yeah, I, I I'm like that. And, and like you said, you have, like, when you, when you see YouTube videos of you playing, you know, I mean, you see it. It's kind of funny. Like I was the quiet one. Like I wasn't the cheerleader. I I would say, oh, yeah, let's go yeah. guys. Let's just do it. No matter well, what like, we got to do. Well, like even, even like you see me, you'll see me hit a homer. Yeah. I have zero facial expression. Yeah. It's like, I have no celebration. I have no. Just like give me around the bases. I'm, I gotta get home. Back. I'm like, Hey, hi, yeah. hello, hello. And as soon as you see me, if they pan to the dugout, I'll go through my little handshake line, whatever. Yeah. I'll take my stuff off and I'll start putting my gear back. Go back on because you get even even if there's no outs, so I'm going to put it back on and I'm going to get back into my mode because I know my job isn't finished. Yeah, I mean, I know so, people um, on the line talk smack back in the day, and I just was just oh, like, yeah. I was just very quiet, and um, you know, I took that job very seriously, even though it was high school. Yeah, I took it seriously because I have to protect my quarterback. I got to protect the running back. They were my friends. Well, but correct. they're it's like, it's like your job is to to protect other people. And I was kind of like catching like yeah. my job is to do my best to make you look better, to make, you know, give us a better chance to win. Yeah. And um, it's like the same thing. I've had I've had a couple times in my career. Uh, where I've literally I've shown legitimate emotion after a homer, you know, mm. and it's usually because there's turmoil between teams mm -hmm. or or somebody's, you know, thrown at me or yeah. one of my teammates. And I'm like, OK, I'm about to light your ass up. And when I do it, yeah, I'm, I, I'm talking all I'm talking all type of shit. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But it's retaliation. Exactly. Like, other, than, other than that, dude, I'll be I'm I'm quiet and I just I, I like the dirty work. And I'll go back there and I'll get my ass kicked. But if we win, it's worth it. Yeah, exactly. I well, I got to say, yeah. you, you might be the most intimidated catcher I've ever seen. But I'll be honest with you, you're, most, you're one of the most humble guys that I I, I met. Well, I appreciate it. I appreciate you it. Know, um, you know, man, I, I got to say, it's been an hour already talking to you. you I think you and I could talk for hours about stuff, which is kind of no, good. No, we, we could. But I, I, got, I got a few more minutes for you. And then I no, got to no. get to my lesson. No, no, no. That's the other thing too. Like, I, I don't want to take up too much of your time. No, um, right. You know, Bruce, I got to thank you for coming on. Thank you for showing, 
showing, but explaining, you know, everything with us. Before we sign off, where can people find you to reach out to you, talk to you, or even watch um, you? So first of all, I appreciate the invitation, man. I, I love talking to you guys and and whoever it may be because you know, you're genuinely curious or you want these inform this information mm -hmm. or whatever have you. So I just appreciate you respecting it uh, and respecting me and thinking highly of, of me enough to invite me on one of these things. Um, but you can find me. So I have my Instagram obviously is Bruce Max. If you type in Bruce Maxwell, I mean, it's, it's pretty, pretty self-explanatory. Um, on Instagram, Twitter, um, TikTok, all those names are, are the same, um, same names. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm actually down here in LA right now. I, I teach kids in Anaheim. I teach kids out in the um, Huntington Beach, and I'm in West Covina right now um, at the main place that I work at. Um, but if if any of your if your followers or listeners or viewers have any type of questions or if we're near each other and you'd like me to to reach out and, and us work together, please give me a shout. I answer my own messages. Yes, you uh, I'm, not, I'm not that damn important to have somebody <laughs> answer my own messages. Um, because I genuinely want to I want to give you the right information. Mm -hmm. Um I, I do care about that. I do care about working with you the right way to give you the right tools to be successful. And um it's the only thing I really know. It's how I work. And so um if anybody ever needs anything that's listening please reach out to me on my social medias. I'll get back to you accordingly as soon as I can. Um, Work-wise, personal-wise, um, just asking questions, please. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I'll I'll make sure I, I respond accordingly and give you the best possible um, answer I can. And if I can, I'll find it for you. I Listen, I appreciate that so much. And like, as you can see, guys, you work hard, the dedication, the sweat, blood and tears this man has put into his career. And now he's teaching it is an amazing thing. And don't ever give up on your dreams because it can't come true as I am now one of those living proofs. So Bruce, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I really appreciate it. And this is how I end my show. It's nothing but love, peace and happiness. Good night, everybody. Good night, man.